the Managing Director of Agile Alliance. And I'll just say I'm really sad that I can't be there in person for Agility today because that's where I was this time last year. Uh, Scott, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Scott Ambler. I'm the uh, Vice President and Chief Scientist for Discipline Agile at uh, PMI, Project Management Institute. And as you probably know, I'm one of the co-creators of the Discipline Agile Toolkit, as well as the thought leader behind Agile Modeling and Agile Data uh, back in the day. <laughs> Excellent. That was years ago. Yeah, <laughs> when T-Rex roamed the earth. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I've got a bit of a dinosaur fixation. Um, I want, I want to thank everybody who's joining us today. Uh, when Scott and I were talking about this, the sort of the theme we came up for, for this session is what got us here won't get you there. And what I have in mind for this session is for us to have a conversation about what we have learned during the past 12 months as, as the pandemic has completely shifted our way of working. What are the things that we need to think about? What is it we need to... From my point of view, I want to think about what is it we need to uninvent. Um, and to set context for this conversation, I just want to talk for a moment about a book that I absolutely adore called The Art of Possibility by um, Benjamin Zander and Rosamond Stone Zander. It is a, I love it because it is a great book for reminding yourself about how, um, how little is written in stone and how much opportunity there is for you, each of us, for you, for me, for everybody, to reframe how we think about the challenges we face, how we think about you know, our place in the world and how we operate in it, how we, how we work with each other to uh, achieve very different things. And it's something that I reread fairly regularly. And one of the, they present a series of rules in the book. And the first rule they, they present is it's all invented. Everything, except for the laws of nature, gravity, time, we make them up, they're human constructs. And I wanted to set the stage for this conversation by, by just sharing a, a very simple quote from the book about how we might think about this practice if it's all invented. And I know Scott has a different opinion about it, which I'm gonna give him a chance to talk about in a second too. Um, and, and the way we can start to think about this is start to ask ourselves, what assumption am I making that I'm not making, that I'm not aware that I'm making? What do I think is true? You know, what assumption am I making that I'm not aware I'm making that gives me what I see? And then when you have an answer to that question, the next question to ask yourself is, what might I now invent that I haven't yet invented that would give me other choices? And I think this is one of the key practices in terms of thinking about challenging all of the things that we thought about, what was true about how we might work before, how we got to today, how, or how we got to the start of this pandemic, the things that we assumed about the right ways to work. What are the things that we need to challenge and think about differently? So I wanted to open this conversation by asking the room the question, what assumption or belief about how to work and specifically about how to work in an agile way has been most challenged by the circumstances of the pandemic. What things have, have you thought, whoa, this doesn't work for us anymore, but I thought this was the way to do things. Does anybody want to jump in and share, share an idea? Meeting and getting you know, things discussed, clarified, that has stopped. Do you feel frustrated sitting here and just, you know, assuming this is how it might be? Even if you have to empathize with your vendor, uh, you just feel like, okay, fine, I understand it must be difficult at your end. Wherein I don't understand. I don't give a shit about it because you screwed the whole work. I think that's the worst part. Not being able to go there and speak. Uh, what other? Oh. Uh, so uh, my assumption was that before uh, the pandemic that in agile, uh, the teams have to be in the same place. They have to work together and uh, out of the same location, talk every day uh, face to face with each other, uh, coordinate, communicate. And that is how it, uh, it will work, you know, 
being co-located or being in different locations doesn't work very well for agile. But uh, with pandemic, we were all forced to uh, work from home from different locations and make it work that you know we are still make it work and communicate and keep those channels open uh, through different things. Yeah, one more thing, I guess, uh, like another part of the story is like most of the time uh, was just spanned into like uh, into a single word, like, can you hear me? So most of the time when we are connecting, so we are only like repeatedly speaking, uh, speaking the same word, like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? So that was not expected by me uh, because uh, as we are working in Agile, like as uh, the members had already like mentioned that we need a continuous communication among each other and uh, we also need to track like what exactly uh, thing, the things which we have covered up. But uh, there are the cases where like uh, our internet just got disconnected. So in that way, we just lost what other person has said. So this sometimes like uh, it caused some uh, miscommunication as well, uh, because sometimes people have to like uh, work on their assumption basis, like what the other people might have said, just because of the like bad internet connection. So that also affected at some point. I think I, I think that's hit us all. I'll say that one of the assumptions that I've made is, yeah, is that my internet would be stable all the time. <laughs> and no, no, it isn't. And I'll just warn you that if it happens, if the brownout happens while we're talking today, it's me, not you. So the joys but of internet. That's very hard thing, stable network. Sorry. I said that's very hard thing, a stable network. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So one thing I want to add. Uh, sorry, uh, Alan, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, Niraj, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. How about you speak, and then I want to hand it back over to Scott for a little bit. Okay, sure. Yeah, very quickly. So one thing, one change which I've experienced after the pandemic is because people are working from home, it's taken for granted that you will be available all the time. And I think that that's a big uh, concern to many people working from home because. You, because you're from home, you get called every time, you know, thinking, hey, there's no work-life balance. It's kind of grayed up. Your day starts early, ends very late, but there is no in-betweens. So back-to-back -back meetings and stuff like that. So, Yeah, I, I think that's something that we didn't realize how much we relied on time boxing being related to being in a particular place or being in a particular context. And as we've changed how we work, that's something we definitely need to think about. How do we, how do we do this differently than we have in the past? And now I want to throw the question to Scott. Over the past, you know, in the current circumstances, what what belief of yours about how to work has been challenged the most, or what has surprised you the most? Um, what surprised? Nothing really. Um, so I've been I've been doing remote work for 15, 20 years. So. Um, yeah, I'm in more of the same uh, position on this one. And one of the things we always did in the DA toolkit, I wanna, I wanna jump on what Nikita said in a few minutes, but um, is we never assume, we never made the assumptions that you saw in many of the frameworks. So for example, uh, Nikita was earlier talking about how, you know, her big assumption was that, you know, the, the remote around remote work that, you know, the, the frameworks and, and many of the purists, you know, were telling us like a, a year or so ago that you must be co-located, right? And, and that, you know, and I'm going to be blunt, that was ignorant nonsense. It was just mm -hmm. ignorant. Um, there's like no other word I can come up with to describe that advice um, because it was observably not true even at that time and and several years before I, um, I as you know as many of you might know um, I published industry research on these very topics for like the last 10 15 years and there was ample evidence that people were successfully doing agile in remote situations um, this was not new it, well this to the overall community this was not new yet the purists were preaching that right so and, and as a result so be, and so I would argue that the issue isn't one of having to reinvent or having to invent invent things it's that in many ways yes a lot of these techniques have in fact been invented but you're probably unaware of them and the reason why you're unaware of them is because you're stuck in framework jail or method jail um, this is a, 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 a term coined by Ira Jakobson, and he likes to talk. And, and what happens is the frameworks like Scrum and Safe and others solve a certain problem, and they put you into a certain mindset. 
Um, and as we all know, a year or so ago, part of that mindset for many people was that teams needed to be um, co-located. Um, when many teams were, and that was that was the the vast minority of agile teams were co-located at that time. Um, that was a complete and utter myth in the agile industry. So, and yet we still had people purveying because ideally, yes, you wanted to do that, but realistically, no, it wasn't happening for the vast majority of us. So my advice would be, yeah, so it's not only, like, we don't want to get in a mode of, yeah, let's invent everything. Like, part of the understanding we need to have is that other people have already invented some of these strategies and techniques. And if, if we know about them, which we often don't, that's the real problem, we can actually leverage them and we can improve faster and improve smarter and learn how to work smarter um, by leveraging the strategies of others. But you've got to get out, you've got to break out of framework gel. And, and that's, um, I, yeah, I would argue that's probably the biggest challenge. Like, you know, if, if you had to challenge one assumption, the word would be framework. And I, I, I'm going to surprisingly, I'm going to agree with you. And I say that oh, no. surprisingly. Okay. <laughs> but but I, I think this is true. I think this is one of the biggest challenges we faced about how, how do we adapt ourselves to the current circumstances is because a lot of people do think a particular framework or a particular way of working will provide almost all the answers, right? Human yeah. brains are wired that way a little bit. We like certainty. We like Tell me how to do it. I'll go away and do it, especially when things get stressful and our cog, yeah. you know, we're all carrying an extra cognitive load. And I think that one of the one of the struggles that many of us have faced is that presented with the current circumstances, we've had to figure out, oh, there aren't all the answers. We do have to figure out how to, you know, how to pick up new practices. How to how to how to do things differently, and to your point though about the word invent, maybe invent is you know you're, we don't have to invent it. I'm I'm gonna say maybe the word invent is the wrong way to think about it. It's but what do we have to discover? Because it might be discovering yeah. what what other you know looking around and looking at what other people have done, even if it doesn't align with how we thought we needed to do it. But it, but starting to look around and and see how other people have solved this problem already it, exactly and and it was interesting so yesterday i was on another call where um one of the one of the ladies on the call was talking about how how her team had invented a technique to work in a remote situation and we're talking about you know what's the impact remote and what are we doing to overcome it and they had basically reinvented mob programming and unknowingly right so several of us in the call do you realize you're, you're sort of talking about you know almost mob programming and 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 so and and this was the issue right like so these are very smart people but they didn't know they didn't have the background of you know what are all these techniques out there what and what are you know what are our options so they felt they had to invent it because oh well, I'm in a unique situation nobody's ever solved this problem mm -hmm. before so we're going to figure it out and yeah they figured it out but it took them longer than it needed to they did a eh, job, particularly at the beginning, um, and there are still a few, you know, lessons uh, coming their way um, that you know were obvious to, to anybody with that sort of knowledge. Um, so it was great that they invented a, you know, that they solved their problem. It was great that they overcame their immediate need, but um, it was really unfortunate how long and how expensive it was, and when it didn't need to be. But it was because of you know lack of well, lack of coaching, lack of experience. Um, but also lack of, they didn't even know the terminal. Uh, one of the problems is, uh, and, and this, and I will ding the Agile community, I do ding the Agile community on this all the time, is they didn't even know the terminology to um, use to go looking for mob programming because the Agile people keep making up all this nonsense terminology, <laughs> right? And, and it's like, like, how the heck would you know to search for mob programming? Like, come on, right? That is, it's like, well, you know, we've got this problem. Maybe uh, what words would I use to describe what the what the potential solution would be? Oh, well, obviously mob programming is the term, right? Nobody's gonna think that. So all these marketing terms and, and Scrum, I'm sorry, it's like all marketing terms. Um, it, it narrows your ability to, to search outside the box. And it, this is a serious problem for a lot of people, which is why we're constantly reinventing the wheel. Um, so I, you know, you know, choice, you know, choice is good and having you know options to choose from is good. But if you don't even know how to search for the options because you're in, still in framework gel, mm -hmm. um, it's not gonna go well for you. 
you've touched on something that I think is really important in, in the agile community, actually, because this is, uh, it's certainly something that I've noticed over the past gazillion years is, is that we have this tendency because we spend so much of our time sort of trying to figure out how do we solve this problem? How do we figure out how to do this? We often forget that there are other people who have tackled these problems before us. And rather than having to design a new solution ourselves, there are other people who know. Whether it's the example you gave about mob programming, it's interesting because it was a big discussion on Twitter yesterday about what should we actually call that whole team programming, mob programming, ensemble programming. And as you say, not knowing the words about what to go look for kind of limits our ability to do this. But in the agile community, we also tend to think that you know, we're just discovering organizational design. We're just discovering cognitive science and about, you know, how human behavior works. We're just discovering certain sorts of technical problems or process problems that we need to solve. Whereas there are other groups of people who have been tackling these issues for a really long time and have amassed a body of knowledge and a body of skills. And if we just know the right question to ask, or at least if we have framed our problem in a clear enough way, we could go talk to them and save ourselves a bunch of time yeah, about how to approach answer. it. Yeah, and, 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 and it's, it's even worse than that. Like, it's knowing to go look. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like not even knowing, you know, like you know, the first step is having the humility to know, you know what, somebody else has probably figured this out or at least is well further down the path than I am. And maybe I should go, maybe I should Google it or Bing it or, you know, whatever, you, whatever your, your search engine of choices. And, and I think that first step isn't even there um, for, for a lot of people. Um, and, and then, then we got terminology challenges and, you know, all that other good stuff. But you're absolutely right. Like I'm, I'm doing a lot of work with the organizational design community right now. And they're having a good laugh about, you know, what we're doing in the agile space, um, just because we're just like stumbling about basically, um, for the most part. So it's, yeah. uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's cool. And the thing that I find when I go out and I have those conversations with the people in the other communities is there is absolutely there's an exchange of information, right? Because there is a lot that taking a more agile approach to thinking about how do we solve this problem? And especially how do we test whether we have ad identified the right way, you know, identified a good way to solve the problem? You know, how, how do we define, how do we break this into a small chunk? How do we run the smallest test possible rather than going, oh, this is the right solution. Let us build out this whole thing and then bolt it on to whatever we're doing. Um, but there's definitely that exchange of information needs to happen, yeah. you know? So um, I, I'm just curious, does anybody, does anybody in the room have a, a thought that they wanna share about their, you know, practices that they've discovered that wow, we could have found a solution if we went, went and talked to somebody else about it rather than tried to roll it ourselves. I saw you just come off of mute, DT. Do you have a story or? Oh, okay. Uh, hi, Ellen, this is Satya. So uh, one of the things that I struggled with is, um, I mean, what, what has happened after the pandemic and, and we're all going remote and, and um, it's all been, I mean, I was also one of the people who read, who thought that uh, co-location is important and I was sort of practicing it to a certain extent, but uh, sort of um, after the pandemic, um, I realized that there's, uh, the, we can be equally effective and we can, we can be equally productive even while working remotely, right? So, but where I see a lack of, uh, <clears throat> A limitation of uh, of remote work is especially when um, regard, uh, related to uh, having empathy with the team, right? So, for example, if uh, especially when team members are moving out, right, and new team members are joining, right, we used to have a physical space where we used to um, celebrate um, someone's achievements, right? Um, or if someone new comes in, then we used to have a sort of a get together and a party and all that, but. Uh, that part is uh, with, with remote working, it's sort of strange, right? Um, there's, the, there's some element of uh, physical interaction which you can't do away with, right? And uh, that adds to the uh, joy of working in a team, right? So that part, I, I find it um, uh, very challenging. And to a certain extent, I think that might also be affecting the motivation of, uh, of people in the long run. 
although there are there are a lot of positives uh, in terms of people um finding their personal time and and uh, maybe um the work life balance is better but uh, i think there's a couple of areas where um without being physically co located it just uh, won't work and it will suffer to certain extent that's what my thinking is yeah uh, I, i'll say that that is one of the assumptions that i've definitely had challenged because i've worked on remote teams before this this is not something new but one of the things that i've come to realize over the past 12 months is how much of that how do we come together as a team is built often built into the physical container the time box container of we are all in the same place at the same time and there's a whole undercurrent of that how do we build relationships with each other how do we have how do we take advantage of that i'm going to say unintended communication where it's just we learn things about each other and we figure things out together not because we sat down and said hey let's talk about how to make this work but because we could see each other doing things and it's like oh that looks makes sense i have an idea to contribute to that and figuring out how to do that effectively in a remote world has required finding some new ways of of how do we interact how do we keep each other informed not just about the work that we're doing but about kind of where we're at individually as people so that we have that empathy with each other that that's been a big thing over to you Scott cuz i can see you leaning yeah, so, in so so what i'm leaning in um so one of the i'd like to go back to one of Ellen's earlier questions you know what assumptions are we making um or have you been making and what so i think that the remote work um question is is easy we're all suffering from that right now and it's been sort of like a smack upside the head for everybody but i would argue there's a lot of other assumptions that we're making the agile community um that's really holding us and and it's been holding us back for a good 20 years um so for example earlier this week i was working with an architecture team and explaining um based trying to answer the question how do how do you do at um, architecture in an agile space and all that good sort of stuff right and they were really struggling and these are smart people who are really struggling and they had a lot of relatively bad assumptions because most of them had it were once again in framework shell right they, they they didn't know much about agile what they pretty much knew was scrum scrum says nothing about architecture they wave their hands and they they leave it up to you and then they and then there's a lot of really interesting rhetoric in that in that group of people around how you know try to avoid the upfront stuff just start you know you know you can get your stuff done in 30 you know first 30 days you get working software and come on there's a is observably not true again right most agile teams are doing some upfront work most agile teams are doing upfront planning and architecture modeling um requirements model like not as heavy as in the old days but certainly um is still happening and yet it's in, our messaging is for the most part incoherent to most people and um and we struggle to bridge the gap to these other communities and and this happens just to be architecture but there's many many other issues um and assumptions being made in the agile community um that's harming us and harming others and making it difficult for them to you know get involved and join um and you know and become agile architects in this case or agile data people or agile this or agile that and so let's open it up like you know so let's you know so what so step back and think about some of the conversations you've been having with your colleagues outside of your teams and you know and and you know how easy has it been interacting with finance how easy has it been interacting with procurement how easy has it been interacting with the data folks or the architecture folks or the legal folks or you know some other you know the non agile folks you know in that vast you know community of not agile so and that and then ask you know what assumptions do we have like, you know, what assumptions have we been making about them what assumptions are they making about us and why the heck haven't we bridged this gap in like 20 years it's been you know, since the 20th anniversary right <laughs> so it's been 20 years and yet we're still dealing with some fundamental problems yeah yeah i think you know i think one of the other assumptions that and this has kind of been a i'll say a hot topic in agile alliance for a while um but one of the other assumptions that we need to start challenging is 
the or maybe we've we've gotten past it already is this idea that, too that agile only really fits in certain contexts and that the people in those other groups that we can't actually the assumption that I want to pick on is that we can't work with them unless they move to our way of thinking as well yeah. because I hear a lot of that it's like oh we're trying to be agile and these folks are holding us back they need to become agile too and I think this is something is a and this isn't so much pandemic related by the way but I think this is more about where we are as as agilists having been doing this for 20 odd years right is beginning to really think a little more coherently about how do we interact group with groups where they're not going to start working in an agile way because agile thinking and agile practices actually aren't necessarily the best suited ways of working to their space so how do we build interfaces with those groups so that we can work the way we want to iteratively and incrementally and still give them what they need to get their job done in the organization yeah and, and, and it might also be that the real issue is that agile ways of working or lean ways of working let's you know mm -hmm. include both aren't the best way for them right now um, yes. It might actually be better for them, but unfortunately, because we've struggled to communicate and even like even take the effort to understand what they're dealing with, um, we have no chance of, of getting our message across because we sound like children to them. I, I, I work with these groups all the time and they just roll their eyes. And, oh, yeah. Agile, you know, agile coaches. Pff, right. Stop wasting my time. You, you don't even know what you're talking about. And, and, and they don't it's on it that's an honest assessment they really don't know what they're talking about because they haven't taken the time to understand the realities of finance or the realities of procurement or the realities of the data management crowd or whatever um and then be able to talk their language interact with them and then give them choices so it's not even it's not even an issue of you know you're not you know you're not agile therefore you're evil um it's like okay you're doing what you're doing that's great that's the best you can do in the situation you're in here are four other options for you and you know this agile one you might be years away from but you know what we can start inching towards it um but if you don't know that if you don't know these techniques exist and if you don't have the ability to help them adopt them then they're not going to listen to you and, and if you just go in with a well you, you've got to be agile otherwise you know you're no good and you can't work with us and you're part of the problem um and it's something that's just so alien to their way of thinking and to what they're currently doing, then you you instantly shut the conversation down um, because because they just roll their eyes and you don't know what you're talking about, even though there could be some phenomenally good techniques um, that they could adopt, but they're just it's going to take them several years to get there. Yeah. So so the, this actually touches on one of the things that I've I've really come to appreciate more in my practice as an agilist, and it's a little ironic given that I am. Managing Director of Agile Alliance, but I think one of the things that that has got us to this point that is not going to carry us forward is even though I am not suggesting we put aside agile values or agile principles or agile practices, I think we need to stop talking so much about agile. Um, you know, we in one of my recent coaching gigs, the other coach and I. Um, you know, our, our private rule was it was Agile Fight Club. The first rule of Agile Fight Club is we don't talk about Agile. But because people got so caught up in, well, is this Agile or not? And that's not the right question. The questions are always, what are you trying to do? What is the problem you're trying to solve? And how are you going to know that you've solved it? And let's figure out how we can figure out what our options are towards being able to solve it without getting into this whole language of is it agile or not or does it fit with my understanding of a particular framework or mindset approach but thinking about let's be really clear about where it is we're trying to go because where we're trying to go is not hey we're trying to be agile it's we're trying to solve real world problems we're trying to improve the quality of our work or we're trying to work more effectively as a team or we're trying you know there, there's all kinds of outcomes we're after and really getting good at defining what are those outcomes that we're looking for what are the problems we're trying to solve to get there and then we can bring in 
Absolutely. Agile principles might be our very useful guideposts for thinking about how will we know if a practice or approach is right, but we don't need to double down on this. Is it agile or not? Because that's not a, that's not a great question to ask. And we've spent a lot of time as a community sort of that's that that's the question that gets asked. And that's the way we speak to other people about it. And it's I found it not to be helpful at all. It, it doesn't help. So so in, in the Discipline Agile Toolkit, we we've, we've been addressing this for years and we start. So instead of telling you what to do, which is what the frameworks do, we instead work through what do you want to think? You know, what do you need to think about? What outcomes are you trying to achieve? And then here are some potential options for you to achieve those outcomes. And here are the trade offs of those techniques. So you choose the best you can, like do the best you can in the situation that you face and always try to get better. And so what we do is we put the techniques into context. And the interesting thing about the toolkit is we've captured hundreds of practices. Um, we're probably inching on thousands now. And the and many of the techniques are not agile. You know, there's some very, you know, very good lean techniques. There's even some evil traditional techniques because sometimes the traditional strategies are the best for the option are the best for the situation that you're in. So we give you the choices and, and we don't talk and, and our focus is on how can you get better? Like, how can you do the best you can? How can you get better? Like learn to get better, not, you know, not adopt a framework, not, a, not, not become agile. Like, like to what Alan was saying, who cares? Mm -hmm. That is not, and, and it's interesting, the Agile community has been talking about that for years, but they've never been acting on that, right? It's like, well, you don't, it's not really about being Agile, but here, take, you know, take all my courses and, and, and you know, pay, my, pay for my Agile coaching, um, and I only know about Agile. So, you know, that's all, that's all, that's all I'm going to ram down your throats. So it, it's, it's a different proposition, but it requires us to, to be open-minded, and it requires us to be um, respectful. Uh, of these other techniques and these other options and to get out of frame like like Avery like Axon says we have got to get a framework gel you just you, and and that's hard to do when there's just this overwhelming marketing around around these frameworks yeah I think it's a little sad too because I'm, I'm actually going to defend some of the frameworks a little bit I'm not because I actually don't think at heart if you go read for example if you go read the scrum guide I don't think it's asking you to, to jump into that framework gel, right? It's, it's giving you a set of, here's some guidelines, here's some ways to organize yourselves, but please don't turn off your brain because this isn't the whole solution. This is just one way to arrange yourself and to think about how you structure yourselves and your work to get to a solution. But I think that we tend to, human beings like recipes, human yeah. beings like certainty, and, and I think to a certain extent, we do this to ourselves. We expect that if we buy this book, if we take this course, it gives us all the answers. And the marketing, the marketing around that has absolutely not helped, right? Because that's how, that's how you sell your product by dangling that bit of this solves your problem in front of you. But, but when I go through it, you know, in the you can't turn your brain off. You can't turn your brain off. You can't stop looking around. You can't stop thinking, what are the tools that I need within this framework in order to get my work done? And people yeah. tend to think that, oh, if I just pick up this framework, that's it. That's everything I need. And it, it, it hasn't think, been the case, but it has been marketed that way. Yeah. And, and I think there's some, but that's a bit disingenuous though, because there's a lot of the marketing, Yeah, like, like they say this, they, it's the mm -hmm. art of the possible and it's the, and, and all this sort of stuff. But then there's zero advice for doing these things other than, because it, it almost always boils down to you're smart, you know, don't park your brain at the door, you're smart, you can figure it out. That's what their advice boils down to. And, you know, like none of the, like, I don't know of any of these frameworks that teach you how to evolve out of the framework, right? So that yeah. is the text to me. Like, you know, if there was a framework that says, yes, here's a good starting point. And then, oh, by the way, here are the five steps, to, you know, so start here because this is awesome. You know, this will get you going. And here are the five steps to, to work your way out of this. Um, then, okay, fine. I, I would believe that message. But when it's like, you know, you know here's, here's this magic recipe book of ours. And yes, you can do it. If, you can just figure out all the rest of it. Good luck. It, when 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 that's basically what they're doing, then it, then it's obviously not true. So the and that I think is the is, is where the the, the delta is uh, behind DA, 
We're all about, here's how you learn how to learn. Here's how, here's how you move from wherever you are today. Start where you are today and learn how to improve from there. Regardless, you know, if you're doing scrum, safe, traditional, whatever, it doesn't matter. You real, the real goal is to learn how to learn, to become a learning organization. Because this is what Amazons and Ebays of the world do, right? They're learning organizations. They've learned how to improve. They're not adopting these frameworks. They would laugh at you if you even suggested that, right? So the really highly competitive organizations out there, the ones that we admire, they're all learning organizations. They've learned how to learn. And I think this is what we need to do as a community is, to, uh, but then that messes up the, all the business models of the frameworks. Right? It does. Call it like it is, right? Yeah. It totally messes everybody's uh, business model up, except mine. <laughs> <laughs> for me. No, I, yeah. I'm going to offer a little bit of a counter in that, again, I think it doesn't align well with the business models, but I think if you look at the essence, a lot of it, it really, uh, of a lot of the, a lot of the things that get sold as frameworks, there is, when you dig in, it really is about how do we, how do we accelerate learning? Like that to me is really what's at the heart of agile. That's what those values and that's what those principles lead us towards. It's how can we learn faster together? How can we learn more about how do we work together well? How can we learn more about whether we've even understood the problem we're trying to solve, let alone find the right solution to the problem, right? How can we learn more about our customers or our users? How can we learn about whether we as a team can deliver the thing that we're doing? This, this to me is what is at the heart of agility, but I don't think it often gets expressed that way. I don't think yeah. it gets understood that way. Yeah, I think that's what we're aiming for. But I, I think because to your early point, it's so easy to sell the magic recipe or the silver bullet, um, then, and, and people wanna buy it. It's easy to sell, people wanna buy it even though it's not solving their real problems. Um, we have too, you know, too many people are in that, are in that rut right now. Um, and then how do you, how breaking out of that mindset, breaking out of that, 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 you know, it's easy, follow my magic recipe book. Um, getting out of that mindset is really hard. And, and that's where we are. Um, that is where we are. Um, I was going to say that mindset is very comforting, right? I'm just thinking of the stack of books that I have downstairs that I bought because I thought, oh, if I just read this book, it will help me solve my problem. If I just read that book, it'll help me solve that problem. And the piles just get, keep getting bigger. And I'm not sure if my piles of problems are actually getting smaller as a result. But it's what? very comforting. It's very comforting. But notice how you had to buy multiple books from multiple authors in multiple contexts. And, and you're still searching. <laughs> like, you know, have the hundreds of books. Um, you have yet to find the magic recipe and you, you never will, but you'll find, you'll find magic ingredients though. And, and the, the, the metaphor I like to use is one of a, you know, of one of cooking a meal, right? So when you go to, when you go to have dinner or lunch or breakfast today and you go to cook your meal, yes, you could go to McDonald's and, you know, get the Big Mac deal and have the same thing over and over and over again. That's, that's like a framework, or you could go to the grocery or to the market and get, the or go to your pantry if you're well stocked and get the ingredients you need to make a, a really great unique meal that meets your needs for dinner tonight. Um, but that requires, first of all, you know what the ingredients are, you know how to use them, you know how to cook, you are willing to go off and do that work. Um, but then you get something that's that's truly meant for you and assuming you don't burn it and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, that that I, we need to get to that mindset. Right now we're in the, oh, you know, I need to eat, I'm gonna go get the Big Mac deal. Right, and then we wonder why we have health problems. But uh, that's a problem. Um, that's a you gotta yeah. learn how to cook. You gotta yeah. learn how to cook. Um, I want to throw it back to the room right at the moment because we've got about five minutes left and I just want to give you a moment to think about a question then we can have a little bit of a wrap up about it is based on the conversation that we've had about sort of surfacing what our assumptions about what makes us successful working with agile principles and agile practices and what we've learned about our experience coming through this pandemic. What's something that you think you need to uh, I, I'm, I'm going to say either uninvent or, or, or find what, sorry, I'm trying, it's still really early where I am, by the way, and I haven't had clearly enough coffee yet this morning. Um, but 
what I didn't, what I invite you to do is think about what's something that you might invent or uninvent that would give you some other choices about where to go from here. What's a, what's a problem you have or what's a practice that you have that maybe you should start asking those hard questions about, about what could I, what other uh, ideas could I try? So I just wanted to share something which I read today, uh, which is like that post this pandemic, we all need uh, a new word, which is agilence which is a combination of ag agility and resilience. So uh, this is by ThoughtWorks, the company, and they have defined that like agility is the ability to quickly respond to uncertainty and resilience is the ability to quickly recover. And that is the most important lesson for all of us post pandemic that we have agilence, a combination of both of this. So I just want to share this. Great idea. Anything else? I noticed the poll has come up, so I'm guessing we are coming to the end of our time together. I just want to ask, though, if there are any closing thoughts from the from the floor. Yeah, just a comment, actually. Yeah, I just, uh, go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, all I was going to say was um, just a comment that most organizations think that agile is the end journey, and that's not really the case. I mean, that's exactly the crux of the discussion we're having, because they think agile is our end journey, and that's not that's not how it should be, and that's not what it is. So, yeah, and and I, and I think that's key, and it and it goes back to I'll say my agile fight club thing. The when I ask the people, organizations that I work with, what are you trying to do? If their answer is be agile, no, really, what is it you're trying to do? Let's have a good conversation about that. You know, I think that's the most critical thing we start, need to start doing to, to get us to a different place as all of this continues to unfold. Absolutely, thanks. Yeah. I think we are close to Close the session now. Any last minute thought from anybody? Yeah, I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, so I guess I've got an idea like about my just uh, final thought on that. So as due to pandemic, there are so many business businesses and uh, so many new startups which are going to uh, like uh, start on, right? So I just have a quick question that uh, will like, is there any uh, kind of uh, time that uh, like at which uh, organization should adopt the agility or could that be from the beginning of the uh, new organization like suppose if i am going to start new business then should i adopt the agility from the start or like uh, should i wait for some time to like uh, try the tradition, traditional ways and uh, then after trying out something and then uh, like adopt the agility so I'll just very quickly answer and I'll hand it over to Scott. I think when you're starting something new, by definition, you need to take an agile approach to it. And it's not about which framework do I choose. It's not about which, ooh, you know, do, do I need this or that or the other thing. It's about getting really good at how do I define the, the next problem that I have to solve? And what is the smallest thing that I can do to test my assumptions about that problem and my ability to solve that problem. And whether you call it lean startup, whether you use Scrum to do that, whether you pick any other framework is kind of irrelevant. It's the how do we get good at that practice? And those practice, you know, that practice and that thinking, that to me is really what's at the heart of agility. And, and I think that's critical if you're starting a new endeavor. That's exactly what I would have said. Fully 